Before he died, Rob Stark made a will naming his heir. But where is that will now? Who knows about it, and what impact will it have on the winds of winter and a dream of spring? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover A Song of Ice and Fire in full, along with the wider world of Ice and Fire, Duncan Egg, House of the Dragon and more. Oh, and The Lord of the Rings and The Witcher. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button somewhere on your screen now. This video was produced in collaboration with the excellent History of Westeros. Please do check out their channel and podcast, there's a link in the description. About midway through Book One, A Game of Thrones, Robert Baratheon's will becomes a major plot point, especially in the Eddard chapters. It's tragically fitting that the will of Ned's son, who was named after Robert Baratheon, becomes even more important two books later. Robert Baratheon's will, as rather sneakily transcribed by Ned, was an attempt to keep a bastard from inheriting the Iron Throne, while ironically Rob Stark's will goes out of its way to give his throne to a bastard. In both cases, there is a misconception in play. Joffrey, of course, is not really Robert's son, and John is not really Rob's brother, but he really is a Stark, a key distinction. So why did Rob suddenly decide that a will was needed? Well, normally standard inheritance laws would be just fine. After all, Ned didn't require a piece of paper to know that he was Lord of Winterfell when his father and brother were killed, and no one disputed that Rob was Ned's rightful heir. However, the situation facing Rob was far from standard. When he had first marched south and then learned of his father's death, it was pretty straightforward. Without children of his own, the kingdom would pass to Rob's brothers first, Bran, then Rickon. Sansa would be next, since sisters come after brothers and before other kin, but not everyone agrees with that. The North has never had a queen, as far as we know. Would they accept one in this case? In addition, the King of the North and the Riverlands and the Lordship of Winterfell are arguably separate questions. Some might argue that Sansa is entitled to one, but not the other. Others would say it must be both. Still others might say she shouldn't inherit either. And after Sansa, of course, would come Arya. The complications start with Bran and Rickon. We know that they're both alive, but almost everyone in Westeros, including Rob, has been fooled into believing that Theon killed them. So perhaps Sansa should inherit. Law and tradition aside, the bigger issue for Rob and the North when it came to Sansa inheriting was her forced marriage to Tyrion. She was now a Lannister, and Rob could not allow his kingdom and Winterfell to pass to the Lannisters through his sister. As readers, we know that was exactly Tywin's plan, for Tyrion to claim Winterfell through Sansa's children with him, so Rob was right in trying to thwart that. Next up in the line of succession would be Arya, but while Catelyn was unwilling to give up on the idea that her daughter might be alive, Rob had argued with her about it and made his position clear. He believed Arya to be dead. So Rob believed that none of his four true-born Stark siblings could inherit, and he didn't yet have any children of his own. Added to which, in a very short span of time, several events occurred that changed the situation dramatically. There was the arrow wound that Rob took at the crag, which was fairly serious at the time and reminded everyone of his mortality. Then, while he was recovering, he received news of the fall of Winterfell. Shortly after that, the news of Sansa's marriage to Tyrion came and forced his hand at last. If he were to die, the North would be lost. The Lannisters would claim that Sansa was the rightful heir and a lot of people would think they were right, particularly in the absence of any other Starks to dispute it, so Rob needed to name an heir. It would be very interesting to know how he would have handled all this if he had known the truth, that Arya was and still is alive, let alone Bran and Rickon, and Sansa would soon be free from the clutches of the Lannisters, but of course he didn't know any of that. Which brings us to who he did choose, Jon Snow. Probably realising that she would have a problem with it, Rob starts by talking to Catelyn, his mother, and he states quite clearly that Jon is the only brother that remains to me. Should I die without issue, I want him to succeed me as King in the North. Catelyn counters by mentioning that Rob has a cousin in the Vale and that they should be next. It's quite a loose family tie, and even Cat seems to struggle to remember exactly who they even are, saying, 
Your father's father had no siblings, but his father had a sister who married a younger son of Lord Raymar Royce of the junior branch. They had three daughters, all of whom wed Vale lordlings, a Wayne and a Corbray for certain. The youngest, it might have been a Templeton, but... She's struggling, and Rob knows it, and he points out that his father had four sons, and that she's forgetting John, or rather, omitting him. She is not exactly John's biggest fan, and she raises the case of Damon Blackfire as to why a bastard should not be legitimised. The Blackfires did cause the realm quite a lot of trouble, she's not wrong about that, but this is clearly a very different situation. In order to name John heir, Rob would have to first legitimise him, something he can now do as king, and release him from his Night's Watch vows. This creates a different sort of irony, and another case where we the readers know better. We know Rob and John are not truly brothers, but they were raised to be such, and a bond such as that is not easily negated by laws. This touches on the greater near-omnipresent theme of love versus duty in A Song of Ice and Fire. We don't see exactly how all of this is worded in the actual will, which I suppose may lead to some potential issues later. If John is, say, legitimised because he is Ned Stark's son, or named heir specifically because Bran and Rickon are dead, at some point people are going to realise that those things are not true. Does that invalidate the will? That's one for the lawyers. We may not know exactly what the will said, but John being legitimised and named heir seems clearly to be the main point, and there are a lot of witnesses to it. Lord Jason Malister, Galbert Glover, Mage Mormont, Edmure Tully, Great John Umber, and of course, Catelyn Stark herself. So let's take a look at where those people and the document itself are now, who else they might have told, and who else might have learned about it. At the same meeting as the discussion of his will, Rob ordered Jason Malister to send two longships into the Neck, one each with Gelbert Glover and Mage Mormont. They were to locate Howland Reed and inform him of the plans. Soon after, though, Jason Malister was made a prisoner inside his own castle of Seaguard, along with his son Patrick, who was captured at the Red Wedding. Black Walder Frey threatened to hang Patrick if Lord Jason didn't yield, which ended the Malister defiance. Edmure Tully and Great John Umber were both captured at the Red Wedding, and are presumably being held prisoner in the Twins, and Catelyn Stark was killed there, only to return as Lady Stoneheart. But despite all these imprisonments and deaths, knowledge of what the will says has definitely got as far as Greywater Watch with Mage Mormont and Gelbert Glover. From there, it's a near certainty that they informed Lord Howland Reed of Rob's will once news of Rob's death had reached them. They can pass on what they know to whomever they trust, but clearly that hasn't been easy to pull off, or something is causing them to wait, because plenty of chapters have happened since all this, and there has been no sign of them. This is perhaps not hard to understand. King Stannis and Lord Bolton are duelling it out in the north, and while Stannis would prefer a Stark in Winterfell, neither wants a Stark king in the north. The wall is full of Stannis's men now, so Team Greywater Watch may be waiting for all this to play out before approaching Jon and telling him that, according to Rob's will, he is now king. Of course, another wrinkle here is that Howland Reed in the neck knows something that almost no one else knows, that Jon is Lyanna's son, not Ned's. He may simply keep that a secret, as he presumably swore to do, but we cannot be sure. There may have been stipulations to the promises made. Ned may have sworn Howland to secrecy for as long as he, Ned, was alive, for example. Or Howland may simply believe that the time is right for the world to know John's heritage. We will have to wait to see. So, if the team at Greywater Watch want to spread news about Rob's will, how would they do it? Lady Barbary Dustin claims she has men watching people exiting the neck to the north in order to capture Ned's bones, so probably not that way. But there are other ways out of the neck. You could get a fisherman's boat to White Harbour, for example. That's not too far away, and the Mandalays are firm allies of the Starks. But Lord Wyman Mandalay and Robert Glover, Gelbert's brother, seem to be on an entirely different arc to try to restore the Starks to Winterfell. They have sent Davos to find Rickon Stark, with a view to making him lord. There's no suggestion there that they knew Rob wanted Jon to inherit, or maybe they would have sent Davos to Castle Black. And does Howland Reed know that Bran, Rickon and his own children, Jojen and Mira, are still alive? 
Bran and his friends encounter a man widely believed to be Lord Liddell, a stark loyalist who could easily have informed Lord Howland or other northern lords. Magical means are also possible in Howland Reed's case. In general, the Neck, Greywater Watch and House Reed contain many mysteries yet to be revealed, some of which do involve the supernatural. The great John Umber was captured during the Red Wedding, left alive on purpose so they could use him as a hostage against House Umber. He was being held at the Twins, but Jamie ordered that he be sent on to King's Landing. It's unclear whether this transfer has actually happened yet, but we're pretty sure it has not. Perhaps he will be freed by the Brotherhood Without Banners, who are keeping a very close eye on all things Lannister and Frey. Likewise, Lord Enmure Tully was also captured during the Red Wedding. It's possible he told someone else about Rob's will before the event, but like the Great John, we're more concerned about what might happen if he escapes from captivity. Jamie wanted him taken to Casterly Rock, and if he makes it that far, we may never see him again. But there are many prominent and compelling theories suggesting Edmure will be freed on his way to the West, something Jamie is specifically very concerned about. If this comes to pass, Edmure will be free to tell him whomever he wants, and if he reclaims Riveron, their swords will be his again. So, if Edmure is freed, it will likely involve the Blackfish, his uncle, recently escaped from the siege of Riveron and still on the loose. But he was not one of the witnesses to Rob's will, and neither of them has ever even met John. And unlike Rob, John is not one of Cat's children, so all in all, they probably won't be in a rush to immediately crown him. Which brings us back to Lady Catelyn, who is now Lady Stoneheart. Since she clearly has memories of her former self, she almost certainly remembers what the will said and who else knows about it. But she never was in favour of John being named, with her strongest argument being that she thought Arya was still alive. Crucially, since becoming Lady Stoneheart and linking up with the Brotherhood Without Banners, she now has evidence that Arya is alive. The Brotherhood Without Banners discovered her identity and know that the Hound made off with her. So, like her brother Edmure, I can't see Cat or Lady Stoneheart sharing news of Rob's will at any time soon. She will be firmly Team Arya, even in Arya's absence, as she is obviously in Bravos at the moment. So let's refresh our memory for a moment, because the whole point of Rob writing a will was to make the line of succession very clear. So if he died, everyone would know exactly who should inherit Winterfell in his crown. Writing it under the false assumption that his siblings were dead has actually led to a more confused situation, however. Some will obviously take the will as it was intended and support John. Lady Stoneheart knows Arya is alive, so will think that invalidates the will and Arya should inherit. Wyman Manderley knows that Rickon is alive and is throwing his considerable weight behind him. At least one northern house knows that Bran is alive, so presumably believes he should inherit. Far from making things simpler, Rob's will actually has the potential to create a full-blown Stark succession crisis. There's even the potential for Sansa to get dragged into all of this. She was excluded from the will because she was married to Tyrion, but that situation is not as straightforward as it seems, because the marriage was never consummated, a fact well known in King's Landing. And George R. R. Martin has clarified that that means it could be annulled by the High Septon. Littlefinger is definitely scheming to use Sansa to gain power in the North, perhaps after marrying her into the Arryn line of succession, which would make her a very strong candidate for Winterfell. And here Littlefinger, not knowing about Rob's will, might actually push things along a bit. When he does discover a bit more of what's going on, you can almost imagine him rubbing his hands together with a rather smug glee. He loves chaos. Chaos is a ladder to him, and a full-blown succession crisis with no fewer than five potential candidates and their supporters, he will be right in his element. Which is not to say that John, Sansa, Bran, Rickon and Arya would be at each other's throats over this. John has already turned down the prospect of being Lord of Winterfell when Stannis offered it to him. Sansa surely wouldn't want it if she knew either Bran or Rickon were alive. Bran has other things he's focusing on. Rickon is still only about five years old in the books, and Arya has never wanted to be a noble lady. The issue is far more about how far their respective supporters are willing to go to get their candidate into power. So, where actually is the will right now? 
it's not clear. We last see it in a small town called Hagsmire in the northern Riverlands, when those various lords we mentioned affixed their seals to it to witness it. From there, Rob and the bulk of his forces headed straight to the twins for what turned into the Red Wedding. Perhaps he took the will with him, in which case presumably the phrase got hold of it, but we haven't heard that they have, so probably not, and it makes more sense for the will not to stay with him. After the wedding at the twins, he was going to go back to war, not exactly a safe place to store important documents. So perhaps he sent it to Riverrun, in which case the Blackfish probably has it now, or to Seaguard with Jason Malister. Or perhaps some of it has gone to the wall, Part of that will is in effect a royal proclamation legitimising Jon Snow. It will need to get to him somehow at some point, and there is a possible way for it to get there. In the fringes of that meeting at Hagsmire was the captain of the ship Miraham, which was docked at Seaguard. It was he who Theon Greyjoy had paid to take him to Pike earlier in the story, and he had returned to tell his tale and alert King Rob to the fact that Balon Greyjoy was dead. There's clearly a degree of trust there, and we know that Rob asked him to wait outside while he was getting his will witnessed. Might he have entrusted the proclamation to the captain, to sail up the west coast to as close as he could get to the Shadow Tower, or perhaps send it down to Old Town, where the ship was from, to be stored there? Either way, the number of witnesses to the will probably means that the actual piece of paper is not as important as it might have been. If all those noble lords agreed on what Rob's wishes were, that was enough. But at some point, we will see the information getting to Castle Black that John has been legitimised. Of course, things have changed a bit for John since Rob wrote that. He was made Lord Commander and then killed. Does that invalidate the will? I suppose it depends on whether you want it to or not. Like whether you think that coming back from the dead means you are freed from your Night's Watch oath. This is legitimization. Does that free you from your Night's Watch oath? It would certainly be an easier get-out. In the world of Ice and Fire, what technically, legally should happen is actually much less important than what people want to happen. Rob's will will almost certainly be an important driver of the plot in The Winds of Winter, but as a point of division, not the rallying point Rob hoped for. Central to all this, of course, will be how John reacts. Does he want the crown? Will he accept it out of duty? Will he accept it only to surrender it to the Iron Throne under Daenerys or Fagon or Stannis? It's very much like when Stannis offered him Winterfell and the name Stark. Will he decline again? Does he still feel the same way after all that's changed? If he believes that defeating the others is all that matters, then Rob's will might be a path to achieving that goal. If he believes the King in the North has more power to defend it than the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, then he'll take the crown as a way to do his duty, and probably the other Starks would be okay with it, even if their various supporters were not. The North united and focused on the threat from the others. This would be a fitting way for Rob Stark, the young wolf, to defend the kingdom he founded, for his last will and testament to play a role in saving his people, even if it happens in a way neither he nor anyone else could have imagined. If you'd like to see more videos in this series looking at the northern plotline and A Song of Ice and Fire leading up to the winds of winter, please check out the playlist on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon, which is the link on the right of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.